Well, it is a great pleasure to be here. Thank you, Barry, for that great introduction. Uh, Barry and I do indeed go way back. Um, and uh, this concludes tonight. I understand that your last speaker was a little bit long, so we made it a very short one tonight. Um, there we go. So uh, I, uh, I, I've known Barry in many, many contexts, and he is a man of enormous diplomatic skills. He's someone who can break bread with the Chamber of Commerce and lead political campaigns. But searching on the internet, one finds you know, some unusual examples of his <laughs> colleagues out there. I didn't know quite what to make of that. But returning, returning to uh, the topic of tonight, revitalizing British Columbia communities from the inside out. Uh, you folks have amazing communities, an amazing sense of place, something really worth protecting here. And, and I think it's a privilege to really just give you some ideas about how to do more and better of, of what you're doing already. The starting place for me in my worldview is that there is a gigantic wrestling bout between two archetypes of capitalism that I give women's names to, Tina and Lois. Tina comes from Maggie Thatcher's invocation. There is no alternative to the global economy, T-I-N-A. And what's been clear to me is that around the world, really, economic development departments have embraced Tina with three big ideas. Get Toyota in the backyard. Export your goods as far and wide as possible because exports is the only way you get real wealth coming into your community. And reassure all the local businesses that may or may not be connected with those first two points that all of this is in their interest. Now, it's interesting to me that the words that come up over and over again in economic development discussion are attract and retain, attract and retain. You know, typically in a discussion with an economic development department, this will happen at a baud rate about once every 30 seconds, attract and retain. What's weird about this is that you cannot attract a local business. It is an oxymoron. And if the only way you can hold on to a local business, because its roots are so shallow, it's seeking one more percentage point rate of return in China, how local is that business? So really, the entire focus of economic development has become non-local business. We now can prove this empirically in the United States. I just finished a four-year study for the Kellogg Foundation where we looked at the three largest economic development programs in 15 U.S. states, so 46 programs in all. And what we found was that 80% of these programs were spending most of their money on non-local business. Something like 30% uh, of these programs were spending 90% of their money on non-local business. Now the truth is, is that this turns out to be the worst way of doing economic development, and I'll explain why in a couple of minutes. Be because there is an alternative, and that alternative is Lois. Now of course, this is not a Lois. This is the late, great Canadian Jane Jacobs, urban economist, intellectual godmother of many of the things I'm gonna share with you this evening. And LOIS is a mnemonic that stands for locally owned and import substituting business. Locally owned means majority control is in the community where the business operates. Import substitution is just a fancy economist term for self-reliance. If you can do the goods and the services that you're consuming in your own backyard, it doesn't make sense to import them because every time you import something unnecessarily, 
you give away a piece of your economy. So a key to economic vitality is diversifying your economy with as much self-reliance as possible. Now, since this runs against some of the conventional economic thinking, I thought I would give you a couple of examples of communities that have become wealthy through self-reliance. This headline here comes from the International Herald Tribune three years ago. It says, dead-end Austrian town blossoms with green energy. It's the story of Gusing, a former forestry and agricultural town, saw great days in the middle of the 20th century, and then its fortunes declined as Europe opened up to the global economy. They elected a mayor in the mid-1990s who said, you know what, the key to wealth is we've got to achieve self-reliance in one thing, and let's start with energy. So they set up a district heating system using wood from the old forest industry, became a little more self-reliant, imported a little bit less oil, natural gas, electricity, and then they used that wealth in another energy business, and then another, and another, and another. So flash forward 15 years, this 3,000-person community created 1,000 new jobs in 50 new energy businesses and brought down their carbon footprint by 95%. Closer to home, Hardwick, Vermont. Hardwick, Vermont is a struggling agricultural community. <coughs> they decided that the key to their prosperity was to become ground zero for the local food movement in New England. Another town of about 3,000 people. They organized themselves around a bunch of fabulous new local food businesses, High Mowing Seeds, Claire's Restaurant, Pete's Greens, Jasper Hill Cheese, Vermont Soy. They created a food business incubator. According to the New York Times, at a time when most rural communities were shedding jobs, this community, Hardwick, created 100 new jobs just in the local food sector. And closer still, Ann Arbor, Michigan. Zingerman's. Zingerman's is a great delicatessen. And Zingerman's did pretty well for the first 10 years it operated in the 1980s. And they said, you know, we really want to grow. The problem is, if we become a chain like Schlotzky's, we're going to lose the quality control that we've become famous for, and it's not going to be as much fun because we like the relationships with our community. That's why we come to work all the time. So they decided that rather than growing big and wide, they would grow deep. So they looked at things coming into the deli. They said, hmm, we make bread. We could create our own bakery. We use cheese and ice cream so we could create our own creamery. We use coffee. We cre create our own coffee roasting company. And then they looked at the things coming out of the deli and said, well, we have good food. We could create a sit-down restaurant called uh, the Roadhouse. We make great cakes. We could have a mail-order cake business. And we have great customer services. We could train people in something called Zing Train. So in all, Zingerman's created nine independent businesses. They license the name. They meet together as a group of partners to sort of coordinate their use of the name. Zingerman's now employs 550 people in Ann Arbor and has annual sales of $30 million a year. What is, to me, remarkable about Zingerman's is that economic development would have pronounced it impossible because in the conventional economic development view, we look for clusters of strengths. So here in British Columbia, forestry or health science, these are your clusters of strength. So everything you do has to be built on those clusters. Zingerman's did just the opposite. There was nothing happening in food in Ann Arbor. But they said, we'll build a cluster from scratch. And that kind of philosophy of building a cluster from scratch is what can make 
any community in North America a wealthy one. Now, out of these ideas have come the Business Alliance for Local Living Economies, uh, where I work half time. Uh, Bali was founded about 10 years ago. We now have 80 networks in North America, about a half dozen in Canada. And our worldview can really be summarized in three big ideas. The first is, is that the wealthiest community has the highest percentage of its jobs in locally owned businesses. And I'll say more about that in a moment. The second idea is that a really prosperous community is going to simultaneously be as self-reliant as possible and as globally engaged as possible. They're not contradictory. And in fact, one of the mistakes I think that economic development has made is their assumption that if you just focus on the global side of the picture, the local side takes care of itself. And in point of fact, we know that the causality goes in exactly the opposite direction. If you focus and nurture on local businesses, many of them will naturally reach out into broader and increasingly global markets. Finally, we're not just interested in any kinds of local businesses. We're interested in businesses that model the highest possible labor and environmental standards. We think the high road is possible. And the, the only way you're going to find the high road is if you look for it. So we look for great labor-friendly, environmentally friendly businesses. We shine a spotlight on them, and we try to spread these models as far and wide as we can. Now, what I want to talk about in the next half hour or so are two ideas. Um, one is, is why computers fail. <laughs> It'll be back at some point. One, one is, is why, why Lois is a better bet than Tina. And the other is how you can get from here to there. And I'm mindful that we're sitting in a room mostly of local politicians. And so I want to mostly focus on public policy ideas. So um, there we go. All right, back. And yeah, we'll skip George. Um, so let's, let's start off in talking about why Lois is a better bet than Tina. So you already heard from this weird guy in the film uh, the example of the bookstore, uh, which I was going to talk about, but you now no already know that. But if we go to the next slide, the point I would make here is that there have been studies now done in at least two dozen places around the world comparing local business and non-local businesses of similar types. So in the United States, Maine, Chicago, Toledo, Iowa, San Francisco, Phoenix, Grand Rapids, New Orleans, these studies all show that the same amount of consumer spending generates between two and four times as many jobs in a local business than if you spent that money in a non-local business. Why do we get these results? Because the local businesses spend their money locally. And when they spend their money locally, it multiplies in the economy. This is now so obvious that it's sort of boring to keep doing these studies. And frankly, I should also point out there's not a single study that shows the opposite that shows that a non-local business per unit of consumer spending will get you more jobs. Don't take my word for this. In the Harvard Business Review summer issue, you might not be able to read this, but it says more small firms means more jobs. Cities relying on only a few large firms for employment experience slower subsequent job growth than cities with an abundance of small firms. Now, I want to give you one case study, um, which I recently completed for Metro Cleveland, that gives you a sense of all of the advantages that come through local business. Um, I and two colleagues were asked to look at what the impact would be 
if Cleveland, which has really embraced local food in this fabulous way, if Cleveland moved 25% in the direction of self-reliance on food. And we looked not just at Cleveland, we looked at uh, Cleveland and 16 surrounding counties. So we pulled in some rural parts of the region as well. The big headline of what we found was that a 25% shift in food, just food, would create 27,000 new jobs. Enough in principle to re-employ one out of eight unemployed people in the region. Where would the jobs come from? Well, about 10,000 in farming, 5,000 in retail. And it's true that farming and retail are not the highest wage jobs out there, but there's 4,000 jobs in processing that are high wage jobs. And another 8,500 jobs that are indirectly stimulated through the economy, which are high wage jobs. Plus, a billion dollars of new wages each and every year as a result of this. Four billion dollars of new output in the region. And 126 million dollars of new state and local taxes collected. So I s happily sat through the uh, session earlier today uh, about municipal taxes and the one idea that I wanted to see up there front and center that wasn't focused on so directly is the more local businesses and self-reliance you produce, the more tax revenue you're going to bring in. This is your tax home run. No matter what tax policy you have, your home run is nurturing local businesses. Now, there are a bunch of other things, too, that have dollar values associated with it. 25% shift brings you more tourism. You attract businesses naturally in this kind of environment. You don't need subsidies to do so. It's an entrepreneurial approach. Not only do you increase the tax benefits, the taxes coming into local government, but you reduce unemployment benefits that have to be paid out. That's about $127 million a year. So together, you're improving the fiscal health of the region, which allows you to do more infrastructure investments. And you're nurturing rural development in the farm areas of the region. And by reducing your dependence on foreign food and, frankly, foreign energy, you're increasing your economic security. So all of these things carry significant dollar value. Now, there were other benefits, too, that we identified from food localization. We weren't sure how to count the benefits, but we know they're real. For example, environmental benefits. Local food enables you to control water better by using more of your farmland or by taking blighted areas in a city and converting them into urban farms. It improves biodiversity, both inside the city and in rural areas. It improves your carbon footprint. Public health, a big issue in Cleveland, as is true across inner cities in the United States, is that we have food deserts. Something like a third of children in Cleveland are at risk of developing diabetes and uh, other problems associated with obesity. And this is because they live in awful food deserts where it is much easier to find fast food and corner store food, it's old, processed, not very nutritious, instead of finding a supermarket. And then we have the global image of Cleveland. Most of us think of Cleveland still as burn on Cuyahoga River, but I think local food has given Cleveland a whole new view of itself, and the world looks at Cleveland differently. Like Michael Simons, Iron Chef from Cleveland, I think is more and more how people think of the city. Now what I've just shared with you is not universally embraced by the economic development community, not because they challenge any of the points that I've just shared with you. What I've shared with you is actually pretty non-controversial. But what economic developers will say, okay, Schumann, if we have two apples, Local apple, non-local apple. Same price, same quality, 
same accessibility. Of course that local Apple will get you the jobs and the tourism and the entrepreneurship and so forth. But these two apples are never the same. That local Apple is always going to cost more. Bigger is better. Bigger box is cheaper. Bigger businesses achieve higher economies of scale. A lot of what I wrote about in the Small Mart Revolution really tries to take apart this argument. And I just want to give you a couple of data points which should at least make you skeptical of the view that bigger scale is more economic. One exercise I do in the book is I look at 1,100 categories which, thanks to NAFTA, Canada and the United States organize their economies around. Uh, these are called the North American Industrial Classification System. And if you ask the question, in how many of these 1,100 categories do we have more examples of successful large business than small, the answer is a whopping seven. That is, in 1,093 categories, we have more examples of successful small business than large. So what are the examples of the seven businesses that are really, really hard to localize? Number one on this list, running your own central monetary system. <laughs> Number two on the list, nuclear power. You're really disappointed in that one. Number three on the list is missiles and rockets. And surely, surely, if there was a category that would be hard to localize, it would be one with an intergalactic mission. <laughs> and yet, we have about 10 of these companies in the United States, and three, a minority, but three, are small and locally owned. So this one turns out to be open to you. My, my point is, is that economic developers are very cavalier about this issue of economies of scale. It, it's like Moses goes up to Mount Sinai, pulls down the tablets and says, thou shalt not do small scale manufacturing. You know, it doesn't work like that. Even if you are a local official in a very small community, your mission should be to find just the right scale appropriate for your community. And if you make that your mission, you will find brilliant models across nearly all of these 1,100 economic sectors. Now, another way of thinking about the economy of scale issue is that if it were true that globalization had shattered local businesses and shattered local economies, we would see a shift of employment from local small businesses to much larger businesses. But here, in fact, is what we see in the United States, that starting in around 1990, uh, local businesses, small businesses were responsible for about 53% of the jobs in the economy. And if you had a microscope and you pulled it over to this year, it would be about 52%. But this is jobs. It doesn't include self-employed people. If you add the self-employees, which have exploded, that curve goes in the other direction. So even though there's been all of this rhetoric about globalization, the truth is, is that local businesses have been remarkably competitive. Now here's some interesting data from Canada which says the same thing. What's the percentage of the economy, of the gross domestic product of Canada generated by businesses of under 50 employees and self-employed individuals? And what you can see is from the year 2000 to, uh, to the most recent year for which data is available, uh, the percentage of GDP steadily increases from 26% to 29%. So again, we're seeing local businesses becoming more competitive. What about profitability? Surely local businesses are not as profitable as Fortune 500 companies. And yet, if I pull out the statistical abstract of the United States, what we find is that sole proprietorships per unit of business generate three times more net revenue 
than do C corporations with partnerships falling in between. I couldn't find comparable data in Canada, but I have no doubt that the same is true here. And if you think local businesses are profitable now, wait till you see what's going to happen in the next 10 years. Because the Walmart economy, where we ship goods 10,000 miles from China to, the, to Canada to be sold in big box stores, is not going to make sense. It's just going to be too expensive with $200, $300, $500 a barrel oil to ship this junk across the ocean. Even, by the way, if the labor in China were free, which it practically is, because the transportation costs are going to totally outswamp the tiny labor costs that are still there right now. So you would think, given what I've just said, local businesses are highly competitive, they're highly profitable, they've done great despite massive inattention by economic development, and they're going to continue to do better. You would think that all of us would be rushing to pour our investment into these businesses. So let's do a little survey here. By show of hands, how many of you have your money in a local bank or credit union? Yeah, it's that kind of crowd. <laughs> <laughs> now, how many of you have, say, more than 10% of your pension funds in locally owned businesses. So I hear what pension funds, I see a few ambiguous hands out there. Okay, this is outrageous. You folks are the keepers of the local economy. We know that local businesses are essential for the vitality of your economy. And yet all of us in this room are systematically over-investing in the Fortune 500 companies we distrust and under-investing, in fact, frankly, completely ignoring the local businesses we know are essential for our future. This is crazy behavior. And it's as crazy in the United States as it is here. Now, it turns out that in Canada, something like two-thirds of your businesses, not half, but two-thirds of your businesses really are small and local. Let's look at your long-term savings. So this is some quick research I did today, uh, that you have about two and a half billion dollars, Canadian, uh, invested in things like bonds, stocks, mutual funds, pension funds, RRSPs, Lyras, RRIFs, EPPs, etc. Okay, let's generously assume that 20% finds its way into local business because you know you have brilliant investors like David over here that are doing creative stuff, um, but the rest, the 80%, is not going to local business. Now, two thirds of your economy should be, is local business. And two-thirds of your investment, if capital markets were operating efficiently, two-thirds of that investment would be going into local business. So we should be seeing a $1.3 trillion shift in Canada. Now imagine what you could do at the local business level with $1.3 trillion new dollars pouring into local business. I don't think we would need to agonize about all of these tax and budget dis discussions that you've been having today if we got our capital markets to start operating somewhat sanely. Now what I want to talk about in the next 10 minutes or so is how to nurture Lois. Because I think there is an agenda that one can follow, I organize it around six P's, planning, people, partners, purse, purchasing, and policy making. Planning means you analyze all of the places in your local economy where you are unnecessarily buying outside goods and services. People means you support a new generation of lowest entrepreneurs. Partners, 
you try to organize local business alliances so that businesses working together are more competitive than they would be if they stayed apart. PERS, this is how we affect the $1.3 trillion shift. Purchasing, how do you encourage people to buy more local more of the time? And policy making, that's what I want to talk about next. Because I think that there are at least seven magnificent ideas that ought to be the focus of your attention. They fought like 700. Number one, smart planning. I, I had to put her picture here. Um, so doing a state of the city report, we need a whole new generation of annual reports to come out of our communities that let us know what are all the leakages and how, what kind of progress are you making each year in plugging those leaks and becoming more self-reliant. What's the inventory of lowest businesses that you have right now? What's their labor and environmental performance like? What's the startup success rate? These are things that you can measure year in and year out and see whether you're making progress on them. Number two, smart growth. Smart growth means creating walkable communities. Uh, there was a wonderful workshop earlier today about placemaking uh, that was, and repairing the city that was very much in the spirit of creating places where we work and play and walk and really have a lot of human connection. In order to achieve that, Jane Jacobs would say we have to scrap most of our zoning codes that separate our functions, you know, where we go to school over there and do shopping here and do living over there. We got to bring these things all together. One thing we also have to do is we have to stop having war on home-based businesses and loosen up a lot of the regulatory barriers that stand in the way of home-based business practitioners. We also need to respect and encourage neighborhood schools because just like a mega mall is a deadening shopping experience, a mega high school is a deadening educational experience. Policy number three, smart regulation. Now, I don't want to pretend I know everything about what can or cannot be done at the local level in British Columbia, but I did want to share with you that in Maine, they passed several years back a wonderful ordinance that said, whenever a big box hell hole is proposed, <laughs> you have to pause for a month or two and perform an economic analysis and look at what the impacts are going to be on jobs and wages and so forth, and then the local council, whether it's a city council or a county council, has the ability to do thumbs up or thumbs down on it. To me, that's a perfectly reasonable way of getting some good information on the table before one commits to disastrous commercial development. Policy number four, smart taxes. Um, you folks are way ahead of the curve because you do have a carbon tax in effect in British Columbia. If I understand things that I read today, it's about a nickel per liter. Okay, so let's do a little Gadonk experiment. I think that you should be much more ambitious. Okay, and, and, and let's just think about this in Canadian terms overall. I would like to replace all taxes, all taxes, with a carbon tax. Why would you do that? Well, you don't want to tax things that you want more of, like sales and income and wealth and property use. And you do want to tax the things you want less of, like energy use and pollution and carbon footprints. I mean, to me, this is a no-brainer. So let's, let's do a little gadonk experiment here. Canadian end-use energy is eight quadrillion BTUs. All of Canadian tax collections at every single level, national and provincial and local, is about $634 billion a year. If I put those two numbers together, you need a green tax of about $7.67 for 100,000 BTUs. That works out to $2 and a quarter per liter 
of gasoline. Now, of course, you would have to charge not just gasoline, but all energy uses in your economy. OK, you know, you're going to increase your price of gasoline from you know, a little over a dollar a liter to you know, $3 and something a liter. Is that a worthwhile price to eliminate all other taxes in your economy? I think it's an interesting discussion. So, as I said, you're ahead of the curve. You're a nickel of the way down the road. <laughs> Let's go a little further. Number five, smart procurement. Buying more local, more of the time at the local government level. I have a bunch of ideas about how to do this in ways that tiptoe around uh, the purported trade agreement barriers. Uh, and uh, Barry O'Neill and I have a workshop tomorrow that we're going to talk about this, so I'm not going to belabor this now. In the United States, I'll just point out that two dozen municipalities and a lot of states are buying more local at the municipal and at the state levels. So, uh, as Kenneth Boulding says, anything that exists is possible. Number six, smart business support. Okay. Now, I know that you Canadians think you never, never subsidize, you never incentivize big business. Um, so I'm not going to even suggest that that happens here. But what I would encourage you to think about is putting a little bit more money into nurturing local business. And there are dumb ways of supporting business, and there are smart ways. In my view, the smartest ways are to think about businesses that actually self-finance. So what I mean by a business that self-finances would be rather than promoting local purchasing in the abstract, let's learn from, say, Edmonton's Originals card, which is a local gift card, uh, and it encourages the holders to eat at local restaurants. This thing is self-financing, and it encourages people in the Edmonton region to eat local. Let me give you some other examples of great meta-businesses. Another meta-business that encourages local purchasing was done by the state of Oregon in the 1980s, called the Oregon Marketplace. Um, I don't know. Uh, you know, so my background is Jewish, so I view the Oregon marketplace as kind of a structural yenta, a matchmaker. So someone would, would call the marketplace, you know, and, and say, hey, look, we're doing flags here. Can you find us some cloth from a local business in Oregon? And the marketplace would go out, talk to some cloth makers, and say, okay, you know, would, if, we, if we set you up with this flag maker, would you give us 5% of the contract? And they said, sure. So this is how they self-finance the thing. And in their peak of operation, they were doing about $40 million of contract work a year. This was in a pre-internet era. This is a home run waiting to happen to be done right up here. What about scaling up local businesses through partnerships? So remember my P of partnership before. And an example of a great partnership is a purchasing cooperative. A good example of that is Tucson Originals. It's a group of local food businesses in Tucson, Arizona that collectively buy food, dishes, kitchen equipment, and thereby bring down their costs. We have another example in Minnesota, where local government and local businesses together do their procurement in bulk to bring down costs. Now let's talk about the $1.3 trillion shift, local investment. How do we do this? To me, the key for local investment is to make it cheaper and easier to create and exchange local stock. Um, now, you, like we Americans, have securities laws that were enacted in the early Jurassic period. And these securities laws make it extremely expensive and difficult for small investors, that is about 98% of us, 
to put our money into local small business. By changing the securities environment and creating local stock and local stock exchanges, we really can turn this around. So I have this picture here of the Merck or Mercantile in Powell, Wyoming. Powell, Wyoming was a mountainous community, small town. They had no place to buy socks and underwear. So they decided, you know what, we're going to build our own general store. They needed half a million dollars to do so. So they got some free legal assistance, created their own local stock issue. You had to be a resident of Wyoming to buy and exchange the sock, stock, and got this thing financed. And this thing has been profitable from year one. Why? If you're a shareholder of the mercantile, you're certainly not going to go out of town and buy your socks at Target. So what used to cost $50,000, $100,000 to do local stock, now there are groups like Cutting Edge Capital which are doing it for five or $10,000. And this number is going to steadily go downward as people develop you know, cookie cutter, fill in the blank forms to get you around all of the legal rigmarole. And we are beginning to see local stock exchanges being formed. Mission Markets in New York just was formed over the last year, and they have a platform, you can visit it online, where if you wanted, you could create a British Columbia stock exchange or a Vancouver stock exchange. And once you create a critical mass of local stocks and get people to start trading in them and you have some liquidity in that market, then Various kinds of funds will start to invest in portfolios of local businesses. And you'll see pension funds starting to invest in these portfolios. So this is how we're going to make this, this uh, $1 trillion shift happen. And by the way, what do you think happens to the mainstream stock markets as, say, the first couple of hundred million dollars moves out of conventional stocks and into local stocks, those stocks begin to sink in value. So we may see actually a very rapid shift of capital once we get these market instruments in place from the BP and Walmart economy into local businesses. If we have great local stock markets there's lots of ways we could do economic development differently. For example, if you want to do the people part of the agenda in a meta business, you create a self-financing incubator. So again, it's hard to get incubators to finance themselves because, you know, say a business is um, in incubation for two or three years and when they graduate, you present them with a $300,000 bill, you've just destroyed that businesses, uh, you know, uh, 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 balance sheet. So in order to change that, a better way of doing it would be to say, hold on to 5 or 10% of the local stock of that business during incubation. And then once it graduates, the incubator, which is like a little Goldman Sachs, it has this little share of that company, sells the local stock out to the public, the money comes back, and then you've got the resources for the next round of incubation. Policy number seven, smart advocacy. I have the picture of the criminal there because uh, around the same time as the Securities Exchange Commission in the United States uh, was discovering that it had overlooked Bernie Madoff for 15 years, um, they were prosecuting Prosper Dot com for putting together on a P2P basis uh, small lending um, and Prosper had to do several million dollars of legal work to comply. It just shows like how outrageously out of touch our securities regulators are. Bernie Madoff gets a pass and everyone at the bottom can't play. We got to change this. We got to change trade policy. We've got to change some of the impediments to green taxation. Um, and this is, I think, part of the agenda for local officials. To achieve all of this, one needs focus. Because 
you know, I, I, I often get this feedback from economic developers. Good points about <laughs> local business, Schumann. Yeah, we do local business. We support local business, and we support big business, and we support attraction, and we support nurturing. You don't get it. Every dollar you put into Tina is a dollar that is unavailable for Lois. Public policy is not unlimited money. Every hour of a civil servant's time that is put into attraction and retention is an hour that is unavailable for nurturing local business. So I want to leave you with this slide from Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. You may recall that after Indiana had suffered through snakes and spiders and terrorists and bullets, he comes to a crypt. The crypt has the holy grail that Indiana has been looking for. And there's a 500-year-old guardian that says, Indiana, your last task will be to choose the goblet from which Christ drank. And he points to 50 goblets. Choose the right goblet and choose wisely. Well, at that point, this guy, the German spy, jumps to the front and says, Ah, I know which one Christ would have drunk from. <laughs> it would have been the most ornate. He drinks from it and he spontaneously combusts. And at that point, the guardian looks at him drolly and says, He chose poorly. <laughs> well, I would argue that all of us are choosing poorly. We're choosing poorly by not doing the leakage analysis that is necessary to undertake the kind of economic development that we're talking about here. We're choosing poorly as consumers by not buying local first most of the time. We're choosing poorly as investors, as you could plainly see by the hands that went up. And I would say, until we see these public policies being implemented, we are choosing poorly in the political domain. None of these things are easier, but they, they are easy, but they are easier than not doing them. And I don't think any of these things are so radical that, that you couldn't try some versions of them in your community. So I want to leave you with my favorite revolutionary quote with one itsy bitsy edit from Patrick Henry. Why stand we here idle? Is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains? Forbid it, almighty God, I know not what course others may take. But as for me, give me community or give me death. Thank you.